Hello and welcome to Let's Get Digital. This is the show brought to you by digital seniors here in the Wairapa. My name is Roger and I'm hosting the show here today with Sarah. And Sarah, how are you today? Hi Roger, I'm good. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know a couple of things. The first thing is that digital seniors hubs are still going ahead under level two. We just ask that everyone please call our 0800 number first to book an appointment. Um, and the 0800 number is 0800 373 646 and all our services are free. And I just wanted to talk about one more thing. Um, Digital Seniors is really excited to have been selected to be part of a two week crowdfunding campaign and that started yesterday. Um, and we have a goal to raise over $20,000 so that we can reach the seniors who need us most. Um, our campaign was announced with all three Wired Up and Mayors visiting a hub and helping a senior last week. So if you would like to support the wonderful work we are doing in the Wired Up, please visit our Give a Little page. To find the page, simply go to givealittle.co.nz and search for Digital Seniors. So Roger, today you're going to talk about two-factor authentication, is that right? That's correct. And before we address the question of what is two-factor authentication, let's consider why it's important to do everything you can to improve your online account security. With so much of our lives happening on mobile devices and laptops, it's no wonder our digital accounts have become a magnet for criminals. Malicious attacks against governments, companies, and individuals are more and more common, and there are no signs that the hacks, data breaches, and other forms of cybercrime are going to slow down. Luckily, it's easy for businesses to add an extra level of protection to users in the form of two-factor authentication, also commonly referred to as 2FA. So in recent years, we witnessed a massive increase in the number of websites losing personal data of their users. And as cybercrime gets more sophisticated, companies find their old security systems are no match for modern threats and attacks. Sometimes it's simple human error that has left them exposed. And it's not just user trust that can be damaged. All types of organizations, global companies, small businesses, startups, and even nonprofits can suffer severe financial and reputational loss. For consumers, the after effects of targeted hacks or identity theft can be devastating. Stolen credentials are used to secure fake credit cards and fund shopping sprees, which can damage a victim's credit rating. And entire bank and cryptocurrency accounts can be drained overnight. A recent study revealed that in 2016, over 16 billion, that's billion with a B, was taken from 15.4 million U.S. consumers. Even more incredible, identity thieves stole over 107 billion in the past six years alone. The general rule of thumb is that a password should be something only you know while being difficult for anyone else to guess. And while passwords are better than having no protection at all, they're not foolproof, and here's why. First of all, we as human beings, we're, we have lousy memories. A recent report looked at over 1.4 billion stolen passwords and found that most were embarrassingly simple. Among the worst were 1111, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, QWERTY, which are the keys on the keyboard in the upper left hand, and of course, the all-time favorite for some people is just simply the word password. While these are easy to remember, any decent hacker could crack these simple passwords in no time. Now, another thing is that we are starting to get too many accounts. As users get more comfortable with doing everything online, they move, they do have more and more accounts, and this eventually creates too many passwords to remember and paves the way for a dangerous habit, password recycling. So here's why 
hackers love this trend. It takes seconds for hacking software to test thousands of stolen sign-in credentials against popular online banks and shopping sites. And if a user uh, username and password pair is recycled, it's extremely likely it'll unlock plenty of other lucrative accounts. And of course, for all of us, security fatigue can set in. To protect themselves, some consumers try to make it harder for attackers by creating more complex passwords and passphrases. But with so many data breaches flooding the dark web with user information, many just give up and fall back on using weak passwords across multiple accounts. And just to say right offhand, if you have problems remembering a password, and let's say you have 20 different passwords, a lot of people will write them down, you know, on pieces of paper. I just saw an article today, a fellow was paid in Bitcoin 10 years ago, and he put it onto a hard drive that had a password protection on it, but he since stopped using that hard drive. And 10 years later, he found out his Bitcoins, which initially were worth maybe $7,000, are worth over $250 million. He's already in trying, he, and he's only allowed 10 attempts to break open his own hard drive. He's already used eight of them. Oh, no. <laughs> so he's wondering what to do. So, yes, but back then we didn't have a lot of password managers. And what I mean by a password manager is simply a program or a system that you can get, and there are several out there. You can look them up. One is called uh, 1Password. That's the number one with the word password after it. Another one is called LastPass. I use that. What it is is that you set up a vault. And in that vault, you have one single password to get into your vault. And you have to make sure it's a pretty darn good password. Okay? Otherwise, if somebody else can hack it, there's a problem. So anyway, you have this one password to get in, and you can store all your other passwords in there. Not only that, you can store all kinds of other information like bank account numbers and whatever so that you can always access that and find out oh i forgot what that is look it up and so once you have that and start using it it's really nice because then I've, I've gone to like another computer or using my phone and I've, I've forgotten what the password is i can go into that same uh, vault area and find my password now, and is that quite easy to set up, Roger? Oh, yeah, it's very easy to set up. And some people are saying, well, wait a second, doesn't that company know all your passwords now? Well, not really, because what you're doing is you're getting the software and you're telling the software on your computer, here's my password. The company itself never gets the password. In other words, if you lose that master password, they won't be able to help you. It has to be something you can remember. Okay, so it's really critical. No one password, and then you don't have to remember anything else. So it's very easy to set up. But as a lot of people are now telling us today, having a password by itself used to be good. But now, with computer technology expanding more and more, what's happened is that we've got supercomputers out there that can actually crack passwords. Mm. Another place to go to is called howsecureismypassword.net. That's all one word, all lowercase. And you can type in any password and see how secure it is. And it can range from, can be cracked in 30 seconds to where it can take 3 trillion years, <laughs> depending on how long your password is. Mm. However, there are unscrupulous people who can, without your knowledge, put something on your computer called a key logger. What that does is you go, let's say, to your bank account. You type in your username, Joe Smith at such and such, whatever. And then you type in your password. The key logger remembers all these things mm -hmm. and then sends it in a little uh, variation of an email back oh, to gosh. the person who so put it on your computer. how would a key logger be, be put on my computer? How would that happen? By going to Spuria's websites. Mm. Okay, Yikes. so there's lots of security issues we can deal with. If you have something that protects you from spyware, malware, that will usually let you know, oh, wait a second, we've just 
intercepted that and we're not allowing that um, that website to put something on your computer or that email. Okay, I have something that's called malware bytes. There are lots of things out there that do the same thing. I'm not advertising just for them. I'm just saying that there's a lot of product out there you can get that will scan your computer while you're using it to let you know you, you've got certain threats and it'll stop threats. I get a report every month that says, oh, you, we had 30 threats that were stopped. And that's nice to know. And they're always trying to be up to date. There are other things you can do, such as using a virtual private network. What that does is it makes it look like, for example, with me, I'm sitting here in Featherston and I'm using my computer and then I might get a little thing saying, oh, wait a second, we noticed that you're using your account uh, or someone's trying to log in and you're in Auckland. Well, the VPN makes it look like I'm in Auckland, not where I'm living. Or it can make it look like I'm in Sydney or Hong Kong or San Francisco so that people are trying to hack in or actually trying to hack into a different internet address that I am temporarily using as a gateway to get out into the internet. Mm. So it gets quite complicated because the hackers out there are quite complicated. In fact, it's being said now that a lot of these um, drug lords in Mexico and South America are not doing drugs anymore. They're doing all this hacking. Mm. They're making more money hacking into people's accounts. And it doesn't matter where you live. Because if they can get into your bank account in New Zealand, they'll take all the money out and they can convert it into whatever money they want to. Mm. So anyway, so we talked about second factor authentication known as 2FA. This is an extra layer of security used to make sure that people trying to gain access to an online account are who they say they are. First, a user will enter their username and a password, and then instead of immediately gaining access, they'll be required to provide another piece of information. This second factor could come in one of the following categories. For example, something you know. Could be a personal identification number, that's a PIN, a password, answers to security questions, or specific keystroke pattern. For example, my bank account, I'm not going to tell you which bank it is, but when I go into the account, I have a bank account number, general one, but there's a separate number for my internet banking. And when I log in, it will ask me a question. It will say, you know, for example, what was your dog's name, your first pet's name, or something like that. And if it's a long name, it's a better one. But let's say, you know, what was your best friend's name in high school? Okay. Which is why when you see online quizzes, never answer those. Because mm -hmm. you might be giving away information that could be used later for security. But let's say your best friend's name in high school. Let's say it was Joe Bloggs. Okay. So you type in Joe Bloggs. But in this case, with my bank, it has a series of squares. And I have to click on the screen the letter that correspond to the empty square that they're showing me. So I have to count and see how many, okay, this is the third one. Okay, his name is Joe. Oh, the third one's an E. So I click on that. I click on the E. So it's not really registering a keystroke, which is what a keylogger would look for. Okay. But you're actually clicking on something that that website for your bank knows. Okay. So that's something about a secret question. Okay. So another thing that you can use for two-factor identification is something you have. Typically, a user would have something in their possession, like a credit card, a smartphone, or what we call a hardware token. I've used one of these tokens before, and what it is, it's a little number generator. Mm. And each one is different, has a different serial number. So they, gener they, they create a whole bunch of these, and it's like a little key fob. And I would go on, and this is a case for a game I was playing, and they said to make sure this is you coming in, use the key fob number. And I would look at it, and that number would be generated every 30 seconds. So is this something that they send to you? Yes. Okay. They send it to you, um, and that's one way of doing it. The other thing is that it could be on your phone. It could be a little thing uh, you download from their website, and it could also be a number generator. So, and you'll see one of them I have, it has like a little clock face, and every 30 seconds, you can see it moving, and every 30 seconds it changes this six-digit code. So you have to be waiting until 
the new code comes up and it synchronizes with your account mm. so that you put the code number in and it works. Microsoft cool. actually has something like that where they have a six digit code. I have used this a lot with my email account with Apple. Apple, for example, using the VPN, it looks like Ben Auckland. They said, oh, this is not normal. You're, it looks like you're someone's using your computer in Auckland. Well, I know it's me because I just logged into my email. Mm. And my email says, put in the six-digit number. Well, I look at my phone and it comes up and I say, yes, that's me. And then it gives me the six-digit number and I put that in. So I've been doing this for years with my Apple account. What's now happening with a lot of Google uh, email users is that Google has just now said, you need to sign up for this. You can opt out if you wish, but they encourage you not to. Now, for me, I signed in, and this is just earlier this month that they did that. I signed in, I opt for it, but I've never had a notice come up because I've been always using my email on devices I've already used for my email, my iPad, my phone, my computer at home. So is it something that will only happen if you're using a different computer to try and get into your email? Exactly, because let's say you go to the library and you say, I want to check my email at the library. Will you log in using your password? And then it comes up, whoop, please look at your phone. We've just sent you a little six-digit number. Now, it could be that it pops up on the screen, or it could be that it's a text message. It comes up. So it's just another way to say, yes, that's you. So what happens, Roger, if um, you've got a new phone number and it's texted to an old phone number? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think, and this hasn't really happened to me, um, but I think what happens is that you have to, especially with my phone, since I have an Apple phone, and I'm talking about my Apple email, when I started up my Apple phone, it then asks me to put in my Apple ID, uh, username and identification and, and password, and therefore now it knows that's my phone. So it might be the same thing with Google, that you have to go and register, and then as soon as you switch to another device, it might actually say, oh, wait a second, who, who are you? And there might be another way of right. doing it. They probably, in that case, would say, we're going to send an email to your second email address. This is why sometimes it's better to have two email addresses. Mm. So that if you're using Google email all the time, but you have like an Apple email or a Hotmail or something like that, you can say, that's my backup email. And that way they can send it to the backup email, and then you say, yes, that was me. And so you can get yourself covered that way. Mm. Um, yeah, so, so I know, I know. for example, right now there are some people trying to get their vaccination record onto their phone. It's been released today, and some people are having issues with the two-factor identification, but I think there's just – it's first-day uh, teething pains. You know, they're, they're just not quite there yet. They may have some little – quirky problems with some things so everyone should just be uh, patient um, now another way that you can be identified is through something you are and this is a little more advanced it might include what we call a biometric pattern that is your fingerprint my phone my apple phone uses a fingerprint id a lot of phones do that it's not just apple a lot of phones, like Apple and some Samsung phones, have face identification. So what that means is that maybe you get a notification and it says, please check your phone. Well, if you grab your phone with face ID, hold it up, and it automatically unlocks, it might go, yes, we know it's you because we sent this message to your phone. You just unlocked it. And the curious thing about the face ID is that I set it up one time for someone and I thought, hey, what if your grandkids got your phone? You know, hey, grandma's got a great new phone. Let's play with it. Oh, we need to have her to unlock it, but she's having a nap. Let's just put the phone over her face. <laughs> no, eyes have to be open. Oh, that's good. Eyes have to be open. Yeah. Some of them require you to put your glasses on when you do the face ID and to set it up, and some require that you have your glasses off. It all depends on the system they use. But it makes it really easy to open up your phone. However, however, 
you still need to have at least a four digit code to get into your phone just in case something were to happen either to your fingers mm. or your face what if you had a bad accident your face was bandaged up you're using face id it doesn't recognize you there has to be another way and yeah. so the backup way is using a, a digit four digit sometimes a six digit code so anyway uh do you have any other questions about that yeah i was just gonna say if anyone because the only problem I can see is someone with an old, like we talked about before, who have an, an old phone number to verify their account. So if anyone's struggling with this, please give us a call, 0800 373 646, and we can help you if you're struggling with um, two-factor authentication. Yeah. So anyway, um, it may seem like it's complicated, but with a lot of things, setting it up is the most complicated thing. Once you start using it, it'll be fine. It's yeah. a bit like saying uh, you want a new car. It's complicated to go in there, get all the paperwork done. But once you got the paperwork done, you yeah. drive off, you got your new car, it's a piece of cake. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about all that paperwork. Same thing with setting these things up. So don't be afraid of two-factor identification. It's there to protect you. It's actually a really good thing to have it on, on as many sites wherever they offer it as possible because it'll make your life a lot more secure. Um, but I'll just end by saying one thing, and that is even if you're the most secure person in the world with all your passwords and two-factor authentication, you can still fall for a scam. Mm. And... I've heard about people recently who've been on some of these dating sites and one person started sending money to somebody who they've never met. Mm. And they were actually so frustrated that the bank was trying to stop them that they actually went to the bank and tried to get uh, cash to send, mm. when, which is bypassing the whole issue of, of the bank trying to protect you and protect their money as well. So... All that to say is we're fallible. There are still loopholes. But if we can simply, if I want to use another an analogy, plug up all the leaky holes in your boat as much as you can. Yeah. <laughs> you may still have a few leaks. Yeah. Anyway, I see that we are rapidly running out of time here for the hour. So I'm just going to ask Sarah to give our phone number again and yep. we'll finish so up. So call us and even if you're trying to work out if something is a scam or not and you're just not quite sure, then please feel free to give us a call and we can always, if we can't help you, we can always point you in the right direction. So our number is 0800 373 646. That's great. And so thank you. This has been Let's Get Digital, brought to you by Digital Seniors here in the Wairapa. We hope to talk to you next time. Bye.